Westeros, episode 66, Kevin Lannister. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm Lady Guinevere and with me, as always, is Yoke Boy. Yeah, hi there everyone and thanks for tuning in today. We have a packed episode for you, all about Kevin Lannister. At the end of A Dance with Dragons, George employs two major cliffhangers in order to completely hook us as readers and assure that we all crave the winds of winter during the interim. While Jon Snow was stabbed by disgruntled members of the Night's Watch, Daenerys was approached by dangerous enemies, but George chose not to end the novel with either of these primary characters and plot points. Instead, he gave the final chapter, quite unexpectedly, to Kevin Lannister, in only the second epilogue of the series after Merrick Frey's concluding chapter of A Storm of Swords. And while we have previously covered the prologue chapters in dedicated episodes, we've never analyzed an epilogue before, so this is a first. When we discussed the five prologues, we highlighted their purpose of providing a unique and valuable viewpoint and their role of setting the scene for their respective novels. With Kevin's epilogue, the chapter functions similarly to a prologue in terms of setup and unique viewpoint, yet has the added responsibility of providing a broad recap of many different plot threads as they stand at the end of the book. In this sense, Kevin's epilogue works as an act break, refreshing our memories as to what has passed and laying out the threads of story to be addressed in The Winds of Winter, all from the vantage point of a man trying to protect the interests of King's Landing and the Iron Throne. The chapter is both an end and a beginning, delivering on old promises stretching back to a Game of Thrones while simultaneously providing groundwork for the Winds of Winter. But before we analyse the epilogue itself, we'll take a deep dive into Kevin's early life and some Lannister family history, as well as review Kevin's role in the main story since he was first introduced in A Game of Thrones. After a thorough breakdown of the epilogue chapter itself, we'll take some time to cover what the events of Kevin's chapter, specifically his death, will mean to the King's Landing storyline in The Winds of Winter. Throughout today's episode, we'll ask a lot of questions about Kevin himself and tackle the question of whether Varys was correct when he called him a good man in service to a bad cause. But before we get started, we want to take just a few moments to thank some of our patrons. Thanks to our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patron, Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Daniel, Joel I, the Three-Eyed Bro, Chris B., The Song of Ice, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Maltude, Scotty, John Wargarian, and B-Word, The Queen Beyond the Wall, and Mr. J., The Red Shirt and Black. Thanks so much to all of you. And if you want to be a patron of the show, find us on patreon.com slash Radio Westeros. As well as shoutouts and early access, we've just added a new patron-exclusive episode all about the Red Kraken, co-produced with our friends at History of Westeros. So do check that out. And now, it's time to get started with Kevin Lannister. Lord Tytos Lannister had many virtues. He was a cheerful man, good-hearted and gentle, a jolly companion at a feast, faithful to his lady wife, indulgent to his children. Slow to anger and quick to forgive, he saw good in every man, great or small, and was too trusting by half. Kevin Lannister was born the second son of Titus Lannister and his wife, Jane Marbrand, in 244 AC, the same year that the future Ares II was born, and the year his grandfather, Lord Gerald the Golden, died, making Titus Lord of Casterly Rock and Warden of the West, offices for which he would soon prove to be eminently unsuited. In fact, to understand Kevin and his formative years, it's probably best to have a brief review of Lannister family history from this period. 
His father Titus was the third son of Lord Gerald Lannister and Rohan Webber, born around 220 AC. Titus's elder brothers, Tywald and Tyon, were twins, while his younger brother Jason was born not long before their mother's curious disappearance in 230 AC. To what extent the apparently inexplicable disappearance of his mother affected young Titus is nowhere noted, but since his elder brothers Tywald and Tyon were away serving as squires for Lord Robert Rain and Prince Aegon Targaryen respectively, we can speculate that Titus perhaps bore the emotional brunt of her sudden absence. And we've speculated elsewhere what might have caused Lady Rohan's disappearance and arrived at the conclusion that perhaps the modern consensus that the first person of interest when a woman vanishes must be her partner or spouse is the correct take. In other words, there remains a strong possibility that Lord Gerald himself was responsible for his wife's disappearance, and for a full discussion of that, check out our episode on The Sworn Sword. Whether this speculation is true or not, it's undeniably true that following his wife's death, Lord Gerald became somewhat of a recluse for a period of years. And that may also be in part because three years after Lady Rohan vanished, Tywald, who was Lord Gerald's heir, was killed in Peak's uprising at Starpike, where he was serving as squire to Lord Rain. This was the same battle in which King Maekar Targaryen was killed, and still Prince Aegon found time to knight his own squire's brother as he lay dying in his twin's arms. Tywald had been betrothed to Lord Rain's daughter Ellen, and evidently asked his twin to take care of her with his last breath. And so two years later, Tyon Lannister, setting aside a planned match with the daughter of Lord Rowan of the Arbor, married Ellen Rain in his brother's place in a double wedding ceremony which saw his younger brother Titus wed to Lady Jane Marbrand of Ashmark. Ever known to be weak-willed and prone to being mocked, the shy and timid Titus Lannister was well-suited to being a younger son. He was not well-suited to any of the martial pursuits boys of his station usually pursued, being plump and averse to pain and conflict. Lady Jane was a gentle young woman whose good sense, as well as that of her father, Lord Dennis, would come to serve her husband well. In his own family, though, Titus was overmatched. His father had retreated from family life soon after his mother vanished, his eldest brother died, and Tyon was likely preoccupied with the ascension to the Iron Throne of the knight he had squired for, Prince Aegon Targaryen, and, with his own betrothal, to Lady Ellen Rain. The fourth brother, Jason, was much younger and probably often in the company of his nurse at this time, though we do know that eventually he would come to treat Titus with frustration and disrespect. It may be that for a brief time after Tywald's death, it was Ellen Rain who had the greatest impact on Titus. Strong-willed and ambitious, it was said that she persuaded Tyon to set aside his own betrothal to marry her in Tywald's place. Once married to Tyon, and with Lord Gerald's grief now sharpened by prolonged illness, Lady Ellen set about establishing herself as the Lady of the Rock, bringing in many of her own family members and bestowing lands and honours upon them. Did Titus feel overshadowed and pushed aside during that time? It would seem unsurprising if he didn't, though it must be said that the ascendancy of Ellen Rain didn't last long. A little over a year after that double wedding took place at Casterly Rock, the Fourth Blackfire Rebellion began when Damon Blackfire III landed in the Stormlands with Bittersteel and the Golden Company at his side. To oppose them, the new king, Aegon V, summoned his lords to join him, and Sir Tyon, formerly the king's squire, joined with the defenders. The Fourth Blackfire Rebellion is notable for how quickly it ended. The king's knights broke the Golden Company and sent Bittersteel in retreat, while Sir Duncan the Tall of the King's Guard killed Daemon III, ending that particular branch of pretension. 
Unfortunately, though the Targaryen losses were few, among the casualties was Tyon Lannister. With his brother's death, 16-year-old Titus became his father's heir. Lord Gerald ultimately roused himself from his grief to take the situation in hand and try to prepare his son for ruling. Lady Ellen insisted that she was with child, but eventually the truth that she was not became plain and the lady was exposed as a liar. With her influence waning, many of her family members, including her brother Roger, returned to Castamere. Lady Ellen soon found herself playing second fiddle to Titus's young wife Jane Marbrand, and a vicious rivalry, no doubt fairly one-sided, ensued. When Ellen tried and failed to seduce Titus in an effort to convince him to set aside his wife and marry her instead, Lord Gerald decided that it was time to take action. Ellen Rain was hastily wed to one of his bannermen, Lord Walderin Tarbeck, a 55-year-old widower about whom Casterly Rock's fool Lord Toad said, a wallowing walrus of a man, if bellies were brains, he might have been the wisest man in all the West. When Ellen Rain, now Lady Tarbeck, departed Casterly Rock for Tarbeck Hall, neither she nor her former in-laws imagined that the foundation had been laid for the destruction of her house, as well as that of her new husband. While the new Lady Tarbeck was busy having children of her own, Lady Jane was also giving Titus children. Tywin, born in 240 AC, famously bit his grandfather's finger in the cradle. But Lord Gerald never got to meet Kevin, the second-born, for he died in 244, not long before Kevin's birth. And thus, as we said at the outset, Titus Lannister became Lord Titus, a position he never expected to ascend to and was singularly unsuited for. Titus wasn't a bad man. In fact, as we heard in that opening quote, the world book tells us that he was cheerful and good-hearted, gentle and faithful to his wife, a jolly companion at a feast, kind and indulgent to his children, quick to forgive slights and insults, optimistic and enormously trusting. All fine qualities in a man, if less than ideal, in a great lord who must make difficult decisions and be a leader of other men. In the first ten years of Kevin's life, his father, while kind and generous with his family, was utterly overwhelmed by the responsibilities of ruling. Though Lady Jane and her father did their best to give him good counsel, Lord Titus proved to be indecisive and rather weak, as states which his bannermen and even the merchants of Lannisport were quick to take advantage of. Many took loans which they defaulted on, knowing that Lord Titus would forgive them and the loan to boot. Others blithely ignored his edicts and went about enriching themselves at Casterly Rock's expense. With such a weak lord in charge of the rock, it's probably no surprise that pirates from the Stepstones and Ironborn from the Isles began to harry the coasts, and when Lord Quellon Greyjoy failed to rein in his reavers, it was left to the coastal lords to defend themselves as best they could. Lord Farman of Fair Isle began building ships, though Titus forbade it, not wanting to give offence to the Greyjoys of Pike. Put simply, Titus was a disaster as a lord. His bannermen mocked him openly, and years later his own youngest son, Gerion, would say, My lord father would have made a splendid innkeep, but old Toad, the fool, would have made a better lord. It's said that House Lannister reached its nadir under his rule, as it was common knowledge that for many years the Lions of the Rock were no longer a force to be feared. Soon enough, into this void, another lion would rise in challenge, posing the greatest threat to the rulers of Casterly Rock since Lan the Clever winkled it away from the Casterlies in the dawn of days. But first came the feast at which Lord Titus promised the hand of his only daughter in marriage to the second son of Lord Walder Frey of the Twins. 
As the only daughter of a Lord Paramount, Jenna Lannister should have been a prize to be granted to a great lord, perhaps to create a new alliance or shore up an old one. Looking at Tidos's granddaughter, Cersei, and even historical members like the daughters of Lord Jason and Lady Johanna following the Dance of the Dragons, it's clear that a daughter of Lord Lannister was considered to be a suitable match even for royalty. And so the gifting of his young daughter to the Freys, nowhere near on the level of prestige as House Lannister, and to a younger son at that, without any negotiation or even consultation with his wife, was a very big mistake. It was said that Lady Jane wept when she heard the news, but it was the reaction of the eldest son, Tywin, that set tongues wagging. At 12 years old, Tywin was already seen as being the opposite of his weak and ineffective father. He made his displeasure known at the feast where the betrothal was announced, but it's what went on behind closed doors that may have had the biggest impact. Servants swore they heard the Lord of the Rock and his heir shouting at each other in the Lord Solar, and some even whispered that Tywin struck his father. The truth of that has never been confirmed, but not long after, Tywin departed the rock for the court at King's Landing to serve as a cupbearer in King Aegon's court. At the same time, his younger brother Kevin would go to Castamere to serve as page and then squire to the Red Lion, Lord Roger Rain, reputed to be the deadliest swordsman in the West and an old adversary of House Lannister, dating back to the aftermath of his sister's short-lived ascendancy as the Lady of the Rock. That sister, now Lady Ellen Tarbeck, and her husband had prospered at the Rock's expense, as many other minor lords in the West had. While the Reigns strengthened their position and stronghold at Castamere, Lady Ellen transformed Tarbeck Hall from a backwater ruled by a house in decline into a powerful fortress to be reckoned with. She and her husband set about expanding their holdings by buying up lands from lesser landholders who surrounded them. While it was bad enough that they did so by using loans taken from Casterly Rock, which they had no intention of ever paying back, it was when they began taking lands by force from those who refused to sell that the trouble really started. Knowing they would get no satisfaction from Lord Titus, three landed knights so dispossessed went directly to King's Landing to complain to the king an angry King Aegon sent a terse command to Casterly Rock. Deal with this matter forthwith, lest we be forced to deal with it ourselves. The ire of the king couldn't have come at a worse time for Lord Titus. Not only was his heir in the king's court, but his second son was squire to the brother of the lady he had been commanded to deal with. On top of these awkward facts, his wife Lady Jane had just died following the birth of their youngest son, Gerion. The year was 255. Kevin Lannister was 11 years old when his grieving father commanded his equally grieving maternal grandfather to ride to Tarbeck Hall to bring Lord and Lady Tarbeck back to the Rock to answer for their crimes. Unfortunately for Lord Marbrand, The Tarbecks and the Reigns had spies inside Casterly Rock, and though Lord Titus had firmly commanded his good father not to involve the Reigns, with whom he stated he had no quarrel, the Reigns didn't see it in quite the same light. As Lord Marbrand made his way to Tarbeck Hall in force, Lord Roger Rain fell upon them in a nighttime raid that killed hundreds, including Lord Marbrand. We'll likely never know if Kevin participated in or was present during the raid that killed his grandfather. Nor do we know how the young Lannister felt about his service to House Rain, who had long boldly disrespected and defied his own father. 
what we do know is that before Titus could yield to his courtiers who howled for vengeance, Sir Reynard Rain, Lord Roger's brother, presented himself at court with an apology, stating that it had been a tragic misunderstanding that his brother had thought they were attacking a band of outlaws. Sir Reynard offered a blood price to House Marbrand along with his apology, at which it says, Whereupon Titus Lannister pardoned the Red Lion and the men who rode with him, and for good measure absolved Lord and Lady Tarbeck as well. For Lord Walderon has written us, forswearing his past wrongdoing, and declaring that henceforth he shall be our most leal bannerman and servant. This pardon would prove problematic in a number of ways. Not only had Lord Titus failed to do as his king commanded, but he had emboldened and affirmed the greatest challenge to his authority in the West. Though it was pointed out that with his second son riding with the reins, Titus may have felt compelled to pardon them to ensure Kevin's safety, the inclusion of a pardon for the Tarbex was nothing but sheer weakness. Without his good father to support him, Titus simply did not have the skills nor the stomach to conduct a war against his overmighty bannermen. Having proved himself unable to maintain order and deliver justice among the principal duties of a feudal lord, Lord Titus thereafter lost control of his lands altogether. His bannermen did as they pleased, outlaws plagued the countryside, apprentices rioted in Lannisport, and Lord Quellen Greyjoy destroyed Lord Farman's new fleet, carrying off more women and gold to the Iron Islands. Septons preached openly against the Lord of the Rock, and the Reigns and Tarbecks continued to grow in power. King Aegon sent royal forces into the west three times to restore order, but disorder broke out again each time the royal troops departed. Then, in 259, the king perished in the tragedy at Summerhall, and his heir, Jaehaerys II, soon became distracted by the War of the Nine Penny Kings, ostensibly the final Blackfire Rebellion, though this time centered in the Stepstones far to the south. A thousand knights and ten thousand men-at-arms rode from the west at the king's summons under the command of Titus' brother Jason. When Sir Jason died of a camp illness, the Red Lion himself, Lord Roger Rain, took command of the west's forces. Though Lord Roger became one of the heroes of the war due to his skill at arms, his ascendancy on the battlefield marked further trouble for House Lannister. And that's because back in the Westerlands, with Lord Titus now distracted by the company of a young woman from his household who had been made wet nurse for the infant Gerion following Lady Jane's death, Lord Tarbeck, himself ruled by his wife Lady Ellen, ruled the West in all but name. With political power essentially in the hands of Lady Ellen and the West's main military power in the hands of her brother, things looked pretty grim for House Lannister. But fortunately for the Lannisters, in spite of Sir Jason's death, Titus wasn't the only adult male of his house. We're told that his three eldest sons, Tywin, Kevin, and Tiggett, now all men grown, had served with distinction in the Stepstones. Tywin was knighted just prior to the conflict, and, serving in the retinue of the new king's heir, Prince Aerys, was given the honor of, in turn, knighting the prince at the end of the war. Kevin, still a squire to the Red Lion, was also knighted at war's end. Tiggett, still a squire at ten years old, was too young to be knighted, but is nonetheless noted to have fought with distinction, slaying at least four foemen. In his book, Observations upon the recent bloodletting on the Stepstones, Grand Maester Pycel declared, Those who beheld these proud young lions on the battlefield might rightly wonder how such could ever have sprung from the loins of the quivering fool beneath the rock. And so, with the war over and Lord Titus's eldest two sons, now knights, of some experience, if not yet distinction, the situation in the West soon changed dramatically. 
Upon his return to Casterly Rock, Tywin Lannister first demanded repayment of all the loans his father had made. Anyone who couldn't make payment was required to send a hostage to the Rock. Those lords who had fought amongst themselves in the years prior were summoned to court for judgment, and Sir Kevin Lannister was given the task of leading a company of 500 knights into the countryside to get rid of the outlaws who had prospered there. While he was at it, Tywin requested that he assist, quote, in the collection of unpaid debts due to his lordship, my sire. Sir Kevin and his knights found that some lords were quick to obey the commands from his brother. One such was Sir Harris Swift, who observed the lion has awoken, but having no gold to repay his debt, delivered his daughter Dorna to Kevin as hostage, the same daughter that Sir Kevin would take as his bride some five years later. Other lords weren't so quick to bend the knee to Lord Tidos' sons. Roger Rain, whom Sir Kevin had once served as page and squire, is reported to have laughed and encouraged his cronies to do nothing. Though he expected to win the Battle of Wills with the Lion Cubs, he nonetheless set about increasing his defenses. His sister and her husband took a different tact, boasting to his wife that, I will have the fat fool soiling his breeches and the boy leashed and muzzled before I take my leave of them. Lord Tarbeck set out to beard the lion in its den. However, at Casterly Rock, Lord Tarbeck wasn't allowed to see Lord Titos. Instead, he had an audience with Tywin, who listened to his threats and then had him consigned to the dungeons, where he was told he would stay until he was able to repay all of his debts to House Lannister. In retaliation, Lady Ellen captured three Lannister kinsmen, including Stafford Lannister, the son of Titus's late brother Jason, and brother of Tywin's future wife, Joanna. When Lady Ellen demanded her husband be returned before she would release her own hostages, Tywin suggested to his father that they return him in three pieces— Fortunately for Stafford Lannister, who may not have survived that turn of events, Titus was horrified enough to assert himself and insist on a hostage exchange. Tywin refused to be involved, and so it fell to Kevin to bring Lord Tarbeck to Castamere, where he had spent years in service to Lord Rain, to oversee the exchange. In spite of the participants exchanging the kiss of peace and declaring a newfound mutual friendship that would last for eternity, it took less than a year for Tywin to once again insist that both Reigns and Tarbex come to Casterly Rock to answer for their crimes. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they chose defiance, denouncing their fealty to House Lannister, and Tywin called his banners. The legendary destruction of the Tarbex and Reigns needs hardly be recapped here. Tywin Lannister destroyed both families and their retainers root and stem, the only survivors apparently being two of Lady Ellen's daughters who lived out their lives as silent sisters. Sir Kevin was by his brother's side for the entire campaign, supporting Tywin in his efforts to restore the dignity and might of their house, even as he would support Tywin as his right hand for the rest of his natural life. When Kevin carried a banner to the gates of Tarbeck Hall requesting Lady Ellen's surrender, did he expect or even hope that, in spite of her laughter, she would bend her knees and be spared? Did he regret the apparent murder of the last of the Tarbecks, Lord Walderon's three-year-old grandson? Did he quail at the utterly heartless solution to the problem at Castamere when the Reigns barricaded themselves in their underground fortress and threatened to withstand the Lannister siege for years, but were instead walled up and drowned in place? We cannot know the answers to these questions, of course, but can say only this. Kevin Lannister, by all accounts, seldom had a thought that Lord Tywin had not had first. His sister Jenna would declare that, quote, Kevin always did what was asked of him. It is not like him to turn away from any duty. He saw how things stood early on, and so he made himself a place by Tywin's side. 
In other words, Kevin was Tywin's greatest champion and rarely, if ever, opposed his one-year elder brother. Whether he fully agreed with everything Tywin did or not, he was certainly deep in his brother's counsels and, if nothing else, deserves the term collaborator for a lifetime of standing at Tywin's side. But even with the destruction of the Reigns and Tarbex accomplished, the worst of Tywin's war crimes was still far in the future. In the meantime, the year following the rebellion of the Reigns and Tarbex, King Jaehaerys II died, having sat the Iron Throne a bare three years. His son ascended to the throne as Aerys II, and King Aerys summoned his old friend Tywin Lannister to court to serve as his hand. With Tywin off in King's Landing, serving as the youngest hand in Westerosi history, we don't know for certain what Kevin's position was. It's probable that he remained at Casterly Rock with their father. When Tywin was married, around 263, to his cousin Joanna Lannister, Kevin followed suit not long after, marrying Dorna Swift, the girl who had been given to him as a hostage by her father, Sir Harris, some years previously. And then in 267 came the death of Lord Titus. Tywin's wife Joanna had returned to the Rock after their marriage, and the previous year had given birth to the twins Jamie and Cersei. The new lord, Tywin himself, returned following his father's death to assume control of the West. It was then that one of the more disturbing events of Kevin's life in his elder brother's shadow took place, one that would echo down the years to a time when he was left to carry the burden of House Lannister's legacy on his own. Following the death of his beloved wife, the weak Lord Titus had taken a mistress, who was later followed by another. This second woman, though the low-born daughter of a Chandler, was soon being consulted by the Lord about the governance of the West. She was seated with Titus in the hall, granted gifts and honors, soon began to command and even dismiss servants, and even to speak for Titus when he was absent. It was said in the West that to gain Titus's ear, one should speak to his mistress's lap, a crude jest that must have offended his sons as much as anything that had been said of their father in the years prior to the Reign and Tarbeck Rebellion. But perhaps most offensive to Lord Titus's children, the woman even began helping herself to his late wife's gowns and jewels. But when Titus died while climbing a steep staircase to reach the woman's chamber, she suffered a dramatic reversal of fortune. Tywin, returning to the rock to take up his role as the new lord, lost no time in putting her in her place, stripping the woman of gowns and jewels she had purloined from his late mother's things, Tywin, according to Cersei's thoughts in A Feast for Crows, forced the woman to walk naked through the streets of Lannisport for a fortnight so that, quote, the West could see her for what she was. It's obvious that Kevin was at Tywin's side in this, as in so many other things, from their days in the Stepstones to Tywin's war to secure the Iron Throne for his grandson more than 40 years later. We'll remember this fact when we come to analyze events that take place during the main series. Kevin, at a bare minimum, gave tacit approval to this punishment of his father's mistress, though his thoughts years later actually suggest that he approved of it, as we'll discuss. We're told that Kevin never had any particular title or seat granted him, that he was a household knight at Casterly Rock, but his role as Tywin's closest advisor perhaps meant that he was something more, a de facto Castellan perhaps. In fact, years later, when Cersei named her second cousin Damian Lannister as Castellan in the wake of her father's death and her quarrel with her uncle Kevin, it's made clear that many thought Kevin would have been better suited to the role. What also seems clear is that during the years that Tywin spent in King's Landing as Ares's hand, Kevin remained in the West, most likely ensuring his brother's business was being properly tended to. It was Kevin who was left to entertain the visitors from Dorne who arrived in Lannisport shortly after the birth of Tyrion and the untimely death of Lady Joanna Lannister. 
The Princess of Dorne had become friends with Lady Joanna during their days as ladies-in-waiting to Queen Rhaella, and, each having a son and a daughter, the women had planned to make a marriage alliance between one or both of their children. While Kevin may have entertained the guests, it was Tywin who flat out refused the alliance, offering the deformed infant Tyrion for Elia instead, an intentional insult that hinted at Tywin's ambitions for his elder children. If a prince and princess of Dawn weren't good enough, who would be? Since it's said that Kevin was his brother's confidant following Joanna's death, we can guess that he was privy to this decision and, in addition to entertaining, perhaps was even tasked with delivering Tywin's message to the princess. In the meantime, though Kevin had married Dorna Swift in 266, they had no children of their own until 282 when their eldest son, Lancel, was born. It may be that Dorna was as much as eight or ten years younger than Kevin and was still too young for childbearing at the time of their marriage. There may have also been years of infertility or infant mortality, though that's never mentioned, but in support of Dorna being much younger than her husband, one can look at the ages of their four children. Lancel, born in 282, is a teenage squire at the beginning of the main series. His twin brothers, Martin and Willem, a handful of years younger, also serve as squires during the War of the Five Kings. Their youngest child, a daughter called Janie, is no more than four years old at the time of her father's death, placing her birth around the year 296. If Dorna was anywhere close to Kevin's age, that would make her over 50 at the time of Janie's birth, a very rare and probably dangerous thing, well outside of Westerosi childbearing norms. By all accounts, Dorna Swift was a kind and unassuming woman, about whom her husband thinks, Dorna was a gentle soul, never comfortable, but at home with her friends and kin around her. She had done well by their children, dreamed of having grandchildren, prayed seven times a day, loved needlework and flowers. That Kevin was devoted to her is evidenced by nothing less than his final thoughts of her, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. We know little more about how Kevin spent the years between his father's death and the start of the series. We can be fairly certain that he remained in the West for the most part, his younger brother, Tiggett, was famously denied a place at court by King Ares, and after the disaster that was his father's reign, Tywin would have wanted a trusted lieutenant tending to his business at home, and as we've said time and again, that person would undoubtedly be his brother Kevin. The one thing we can speculate about before moving on to events that occur in the main series is Kevin's involvement in Robert's Rebellion. We know that Tywin sat most of the war out at Casterly Rock, refusing Ares's calls for help and ignoring efforts by the rebels to gain his support. But some two weeks after the defeat of the royal army at the Trident, Tywin arrived at the gates of King's Landing with a force of some 12,000 Westermen claiming to be there in support of the king. Ares's master of whisperers, Lord Varys, urged him to keep the gates firmly closed, but Grand Maester Pycelle, a known Lannister supporter and Tywin's number one fan, convinced the king otherwise and the gates were opened. The resulting sack is one of the most brutal events we see in the series, culminating in the deaths of Ares, Prince Elia of Dawn and her two children, Rhaenys and Aegon. It was halted only by the surrender of the surviving royalists and the arrival of the rebel army under the command of Eddard Stark. There are a number of things to note about Tywin's arrival at the capital at that particular time. First is the size of his army. A significant portion of the strength of the West accompanied him, though by no means its majority. By contrast, Jaime would have a similar-sized army under his command for the first siege of River Run, while Tywin had 20,000 men at the Battle of the Green Fork in 299. But no matter what its ratio to the total available troops of the region is, 
No army of that size could be mustered and marched out without weeks of preparation. In A Game of Thrones, it took Rob Stark two months to call his banners and march with an army of also 12,000. By which we mean to point out that, while he might have been officially sitting out the war up to a point, Tywin was by no means idle and was almost certainly assembling that army to a degree of readiness that it could march as soon as news of Robert's victory at the Trident reached Casterly Rock. In other words, Tywin was as much an opportunist as the despised Walder Frey, and likely only his reputation for dispensing ruthless vengeance when offended prevented people from pointing this out publicly. Having said all of that, we want to turn our attention to what Kevin Lannister's role in all of this may have been. We can preface this by saying it was never specifically noted that Kevin was present during the sack until his epilogue chapter when Rhaegar's children are mentioned. Then it says Kevin Lannister had been there in this very hall when Tywin had laid the bodies of Prince Rhaegar's children at the foot of the Iron Throne, wrapped up in crimson cloaks. So we'll take that as proof that Sir Kevin was, as usual, at his brother's side during an atrocity that resulted in the cruel and horrific death of innocents, including what was thought to be the last male Targaryen. If you see the similarity between the death of Prince Aegon Targaryen and the death of Lord Walderan Tarbeck's three-year-old grandson, the last male of the Tarbeck line, you aren't alone. In both cases, Tywin made use of unleashed beasts in his employ and later claimed he didn't know what they were capable of. It was in fact Amory Lorch, the same beast who was rumoured to have killed the Tarbeck boy, who killed Princess Rhaenys, so that claim rings more than a little hollow. But what was Sir Kevin's role in any of it? For a hint... We can recap those things we know Tywin entrusted him with. Ridding the Westerlands of robber knights and outlaws, and assisting in the collection of unpaid debts, with some degree of success, at the age of 16. Conducting the hostage exchange of Walder and Tarbeck for three Lannister kinsmen later the same year. Acting as Tywin's standard bearer and representative at Tarbeck Hall during the Reign and Tarbeck Rebellion entertaining the Princess of Dorne and responding to her proposed marriage alliance following Lady Joanna's death, and, as we'll see, commanding Tywin's center battle at the Green Fork during the War of the Five Kings and later issuing the commands that sent Gregor Clegane, Amory Lorch, and the Brave Companions out to lay waste to the Riverlands. Kevin's role seems to always be that of enforcer and chief advisor, Knowing he was present, it's impossible to consider that he didn't play a similar role in the sack of King's Landing. Did he advise his brother to claim he came in support of the king in order to get the gates opened and avoid a siege? Did he issue the orders to Clegane and Lorch on that day, as he would later do in the Riverlands, providing his brother with plausible deniability? Whatever his role in the decision-making it seems obvious that once again Kevin was present when his brother committed very questionable acts, some of which were arguably war crimes. Guilt by association is a theme of Kevin's arc, but it's also becoming clear that it's no accident that Kevin is always at his brother's right hand when these things occur. And so, while we'll see that Varys declares Kevin a good man in service to a bad cause, a close analysis of his involvement with Tywin leads to a much darker interpretation. Kevin was complicit in everything his brother did, not as an accidental bystander, but as a fully vested partner in crime. And coming up in our next segment, we'll analyze Kevin's role in the main series, right up to the chapters that immediately precede his death in the final chapter of A Dance with Dragons. Sir Kevin Lannister, his father's only surviving brother, was sharing a flagon of ale with Lord Tywin when Tyrion entered the common room. His uncle was portly and balding with a close-cropped yellow beard that followed the line of his massive jaw. 
Kevin is first seen on page in A Game of Thrones when Tyrion meets his father's army in the Riverlands following his captivity in the Vale. He's in the common room of the Inn at the Crossroads, which Tywin had taken as his headquarters when his army occupied the Riverlands. No small irony, since that's the location from which Tyrion was taken captive by Catelyn Stark. Considering how Kevin's and Tywin's arcs intertwine, it's no accident that this is also the first occasion we see Tywin Lannister himself on page. As usual, Kevin is left in Tywin's shadow. Tywin gets a paragraph-long description, and Kevin is introduced in brief, as we heard in the quote we began with. He's quickly characterised as Tywin's closest advisor, although since Tywin likely doesn't take a lot of advice from other people, perhaps lieutenant or enforcer might be better terms. And sure enough, when the word comes that Rob Stark's army is coming south, Kevin suggests that they wait for him at the crossroads. Tywin, though, has other ideas. The boy may hang back or lose his courage when he sees our numbers. The sooner the Starks are broken, the sooner I shall be free to deal with Stannis Baratheon. Tell the drummers to beat assembly and send word to Jamie that I am marching against Rob Stark. Kevin quickly acquiesces to his brother, and before too long we find him selling Tywin's battle plan to Tyrion, telling his nephew, We had a thought to put you and your wildlings in the vanguard when we come to battle. Not for the first time, Tyrion thinks how his uncle, quote, seldom had a thought that Lord Tywin had not had first. And so it's clear very early on what the relationship is. Kevin is the hand to Tywin's absolute monarch. Tywin dreams it. Kevin builds it. But Kevin is also a trusted battle commander, chosen to lead the all-important centre at the Green Fork, the battle composed of 10,000 men that was supposed to crush the Northmen against the river when the vanguard on the left broke. And remember, that's exactly where Kevin and Tywin had positioned Tyrion and his clansmen. Kevin proves that he does hold his brother's children in some affection when he offers Tyrion and his clansmen praise when they meet after the battle, and when the news of Jaime's defeat and capture at River Run arrives, he loyally defends Jaime's choice to split his army in three as the only option given the lay of the land at River Run. He's present for the first of many Lannister family meetings we see in the series as he, Tywin, and Tyrion discuss their next move in light of the changed situation. This is the meeting at which Tywin expresses his frustration and disgust with Cersei and Joffrey for Ned Stark's death and informs his brother and son of Renly's marriage to Marjorie Tyrell and claim to the Iron Throne. Ultimately, Tyrion is sent to take things in hand in King's Landing and Tywin moves to the fortress at Harrenhal, sending Kevin to ensure that their reavers, Gregor Clegane, Amory Lorch and Vargo Hoat, go out ahead of them, burning and pillaging as they go. I want to see the Riverlands afire from the God's Eye to the Red Fork, says Tywin, and his brother hurries off to make it so, promising they will burn my lord. So we've made a case that Kevin is Tywin's closest advisor, his right-hand man, his enforcer, involved in a number of incidents that could rightly be categorized as war crimes. In some cases, we could say he was simply a passive bystander, guilty by association, turning a blind eye to Tywin's acts, but perhaps not actively engaging in them. There's a quote from this chapter that says, Sir Kevin did as he was bid, which seems to sum up a great deal of Kevin Lannister's character. However, in the case of unleashing Gregor Clegane and Amory Lorch on the Riverlands, we think that Kevin took a much more active role in perpetrating evil. Tywin later makes clear to Tyrion that he knows exactly how bestial both of these men are, and we can be sure that Kevin knew as well. They are, after all, the two that were hand-picked to enter the Red Keep during the sack of King's Landing and kill Rhaegar Targaryen's wife and children. And Amory Lorch had been riding with Tywin and Kevin since the Rain Tarbeck Rebellion. 
Kevin's eagerness to send them out into the Riverlands might be viewed as just another distasteful part of the war effort, but the wanton destruction of property and murder of civilians seems to us to be something that cannot be sidestepped as necessary side effects of war. Kevin had only just recently been telling Tyrion how much success the Lannister army had been having against the Riverlords. Remember that at this point, Rob Stark has only just won his way to Riverrun, and other than his usual scorched earth philosophy, Tywin had no real reason at this point to specifically target the small folk of the Riverlands. In fact, with Jamie a captive of the Starks and Tullys at Riverrun, one might almost think Tywin would choose to proceed cautiously lest his actions provoke a vengeful response against his elder son. Nonetheless, that is how A Game of Thrones ends for Kevin, rushing off to do Tywin's bidding to ensure the devastation of the Riverlands. We next see him at Harrenhal in Arya's POV, when Tywin departs on his way to confront Rob in the West. It's the briefest of glimpses, and he's once again at Tywin's side, where he presumably remained throughout that summer, the Battle of the Fords, and the ensuing march east to join with the Tyrell army to defeat Stannis Baratheon at the Battle of Blackwater. Kevin is next seen in Sansa's POV in the throne room of the Red Keep following that battle. In this scene, the spoils of war are being distributed, and, rather than deign to address the assembled court himself, Tywin deputizes his brother Kevin to do the talking. Kevin announces the new lords and knights, gifts and rewards, and grants of lands and titles that the Hand and Council have decreed. He keeps order in the court when a captive knight from Stannis' army begins to bellow about incest and the one true king— and he listens as his eldest son, Lancel, is awarded Castle Darry and its lordship. When Tyrion summons Bronn to his sickbed in A Storm of Swords, he learns that Kevin had dismissed all of the men he had hired before the battle. The balance of power had tilted away from him as he recovered from his wounds, and Kevin, no doubt at Tywin's command, had played no small part in that. However, when Tyrion joins a council meeting and comes face to face with his uncle, he finds him surprisingly warm and complimentary, much as he was following the Green Fork. Lancel has told me how brave you were, Tyrion. He speaks very highly of you. As that council plays out, the match between Peter Baelish and Lysa Arryn is suggested. Tyrion, ever the keen observer, notes the ease with which his uncle manipulates the outcome in favor of what were clearly Lord Tywin's wishes. Sir Kevin was his brother's vanguard and counsel, Tyrion knew from long experience. He never had a thought that Lord Tywin had not had first. It has all been settled beforehand, he concluded, and this discussion's no more than show. We've heard this sentiment from Tyrion before. Kevin is basically his father's mouthpiece, except possibly for the rare occasions when he shows approval or slight affection to his nephew, as in the aftermath of the battles at the Green Fork and Blackwater. But this was no such moment, as the flip side of the Little Finger Liza match would be the need to replace Lord Baelish as Master of Coin, with none other than Tyrion himself. Kevin's comments here are no more than pandering to Tywin. Indeed, I've no doubt you'll make a splendid Master of Coin, Tyrion. And such hearty cheerfulness is often associated with false enthusiasm. Kevin is selling something he knows his nephew doesn't want to buy, but he does it anyway because it's what his brother has decided upon. Moments later, Tywin mentions the possibility of a better option to an alliance with Balon Greyjoy, and Kevin states that it's time to move on to planning the upcoming wedding of Joffrey and Marjorie Tyrell. Tyrion is well aware that something is going on in the background, He recalls letters his father had been writing when Tyrion visited him after rising from his sickbed. He knows there's something being left unsaid, and the swiftness with which Kevin changes the subject is a strong indicator that he was aware of it as well, and given his position so close to Tywin, it's possible he knew or guessed exactly what the something was. 
later, when the meeting was adjourned and only the family remained, Tyrion expressed his discomfort with the role he was being asked to assume. He points out correctly that Littlefinger was a dangerous ally and not to be trusted. Here's the passage. He won Highgarden to our side, Cersei began, and sold you Ned Stark, I know. He will sell us just as quick. A coin is as dangerous as a sword in the wrong hands. His uncle Kevin looked at him oddly. Not to us, surely. The gold of Casterly Rock is dug from the ground. Littlefinger's gold is made from thin air with a snap of his fingers. Kevin has ultimate faith in the power of Tywin and Lannister gold to bend the world to the shape House Lannister wishes to see. Such faith will ultimately prove misplaced, since, as we know, Tyrion was exactly correct, and the decisions of that council actually enabled not only Joffrey's death, but ultimately Tywin's as well, not to mention Tyrion's exile. A moment of trusting Peter Baelish led to the steep decline of Lannister fortunes that we see in A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons. Kevin didn't see it coming, because his hubristic brother did not. Only Tyrion, the unwanted and despised offspring used to observing his surroundings closely for signs of danger, saw the writing on that wall. And speaking of writing on the wall, the hints at a better option now begin to take form. Kevin tells the family that Littlefinger has revealed a plot by the Tyrells to marry Sansa Stark to Willis. Tyrion is interested to hear that it was Baelish who broke this news, as he should have been, but before he can puzzle it out, Tywin goes on to lay out his plan to forestall the plot. In short, it comes down to marry Tyrion to Sansa and offer Cersei for Willis to shore up the alliance with the Tyrells. It makes complete sense, though no one in the room knows the extent to which Baelish has already betrayed them. Nonetheless, Tywin's conviction that Cersei marry again is something that will stick with Kevin, even as Littlefinger's own plot unfolds like a poisonous flower in their midst. At the same time, hints at the Red Wedding intensify. Tyrion wonders why Rob Stark wouldn't get in the way of him claiming Winterfell in Sansa's name, as his uncle insists he'll be able to do and he's almost at the crux of his father's plotting, but he doesn't quite figure it out. It's Kevin who then gives the background of House Westerling as he, Tywin, and Tyrion discuss Rob Stark's sudden and ill-fated marriage to Lord Gowan Westerling's daughter, Jane. It's impossible to believe that Kevin wasn't in his brother's confidence at this point. Kevin would have had the same reaction as Tyrion upon first hearing this news, knowing firsthand that Tywin, quote, did not suffer disloyalty in his vassals, and being fully aware of the proximity of the crag to Castamere and Tarbeck Hall that Tyrion points out. The main difference, of course, being that Tywin is much more likely to have confided in his brother than in his son. When the news of the death of Kevin's son Willem arrives, we do get to see another side of Tywin's chief lieutenant. Tyrion is tasked with repairing the city walls and gates that were damaged during the Battle of the Blackwater. It says, The task was to have been his uncle's, but solid, steady, tireless Sir Kevin Lannister had not been himself since the raven had come from River Run with word of his son's murder. Willem's twin Martin had been taken captive by Rob Stark as well, and their elder brother Lancel was still abed, beset by an ulcerating wound that would not heal. With one son dead and two more in mortal danger, Sir Kevin was consumed by grief and fear. Lord Tywin had always relied on his brother, but now he had no choice but to turn again to his dwarf son. Since Kevin had retired somewhat from official duties to deal with his grief, he may not have been fully involved with the actual details of the Red Wedding. When news of Rob's and Catelyn's deaths reaches King's Landing days before Joffrey's wedding to Marjorie, Kevin is again present at the family meeting and is shocked by Joffrey's request to serve Rob's head to Sansa at his wedding feast. When Joffrey fails to take a hint 
and turns to insulting his grandfather, Kevin is tasked with removing the king and putting him to bed with a cup of dream wine. Days later, Kevin and his son Lancel are present at Joffrey's wedding, charmed by Sansa's kind words to Lancel. In the aftermath of Joffrey's death, it's Kevin who visits Tyrion daily to discuss the accusations against his nephew and Tyrion's defence. In spite of Tyrion's insistence, I did not do this, his inability to provide witnesses combined with Pycelle's and Taina Merriweather's testimony at the trial all served to convince his uncle of his guilt. Nonetheless, Kevin still brings Tyrion Tywin's offer of taking the black if he will simply confess to the deed and bring the public embarrassment of his trial to an end. When Tyrion flatly declines, still insisting his innocence, Kevin makes a brief speech that is as revealing about him as it is about Tywin. Do you think he would allow you to take the black if you are not his own blood and Joanna's? Tywin seems a hard man to you, I know, but he is no harder than he's had to be. Our own father was gentle and amiable, but so weak his bannermen mocked him in their cups. Some saw fit to defy him openly. Other lords borrowed our gold and never troubled to repay it. At court they japed of toothless lions. Even his mistress stole from him. A woman scarcely one step above a whore, and she helped herself to my mother's jewels. It fell to Tywin to restore House Lannister to its proper place. Just as it fell to him to rule this realm when he was no more than twenty. He bore that heavy burden for twenty years, and all it earned him was a mad king's envy. Instead of the honour he deserved, he was made to suffer slights beyond count, yet he gave the seven kingdoms peace, plenty, and justice. He is a just man. You would be wise to trust him. Tyrion, it says, is astonished by such a passionate speech from his, quote, solid, stolid, pragmatic uncle. He accuses Kevin of loving Tywin, to which Kevin simply replies, he is my brother, a short and simple explanation for years of standing by a man as hard and unyielding as Tywin. We're reminded that Kevin would also have been affected by the shame of his family's disarray and decline in his young years, and that it was Tywin who saved him from that shame. Whatever else may be said of Tywin, he certainly had the last laugh when it came to those who took advantage of and mocked his father for his weakness and foolishness, as well as those who openly mocked him in Ares's court. Kevin, who is several times revealed to have a sensitive side when it comes to his family, would have appreciated that more than anyone. Kevin is next seen by Tyrion at his trial by combat. Since A Game of Thrones, we've seen him mainly from his nephew's point of view, but that is about to change. With Oberyn Martell's death, Tyrion is declared guilty and his life forfeit. From this moment on, our perspective on Kevin shifts to Jamie and Cersei. He is once again the loyal retainer, ever doing his brother's bidding, and we see him assisting Tommen in signing the charters distributing rewards to those responsible for the Red Wedding. Kevin asks Jamie to mend his fences with Tywin, and Jamie refuses. And the next time we see him, it's in Tywin's chamber on the night of his death. Cersei sees her uncle praying over his brother's body and decides that he must be the new hand, not because he can take Tywin's place, but, she thinks, because he won't stand in the way of her taking Tywin's place. The next hand will know his place, she promised herself. It would have to be Sir Kevin. Her uncle was tireless, prudent, unfailingly obedient. She could rely on him as her father had. The hand does not argue with the head. And to that end, Cersei summons her uncle to dine with her the night of Tywin's funeral. Though Kevin is still clearly in the throes of grief, she has a request to make of him, though not before she ignores his advice against antagonising Mace Tyrell in the matter of his uncle serving as master of coin. 
That post will go to her own choice, Giles Rosby, a man she thinks she can control. As for the handship, she has chosen another man she thinks she can control, Kevin himself. Though she doesn't put it quite that bluntly to his face. Instead, she asks, Who better to finish my father's work than the brother who shared all his counsels? Kevin expresses his grief and his desire to see and support his own immediate family. Nonetheless, he does agree that he will do as she asks, but on one condition. So long as you name me Regent as well as Hand and take yourself back to Casterly Rock. In the face of Cersei's disbelief, he tells her that that is exactly what Tywin had intended, though he acknowledges that he won't force her to remarry as her father would have done. When she insists that she is the regent and her place is with Tommen, his answer is simply, your father thought not. It's clear now that Tywin had confided in his brother about all three of his children, though Kevin's efforts to help resolve the issues with those children have thus far proved fruitless, as this last-ditch effort to contain Cersei would prove. When Cersei insists that her father is dead and his wishes no longer matter, Kevin's reply is blunt. The realm is in ruins and only Tywin had the power to save it. Cersei, for all that she declares she will do so, is not her father, a statement that strikes right at the core of everything Cersei had been thinking since we gained her POV. In fact, Kevin declares... Tywin always regarded Jaime as his rightful heir. Cersei points out how ill-suited Jaime is to ruling, something that we'll soon see her Aunt Jenna is more or less in agreement with, which only leads to Kevin once again insisting that she step down as regent and retire to Casterly Rock. Her continued refusal to cede power and insistence that her son needs her prompts another blunt response from Kevin. From what I saw of Joffrey, you are as unfit a mother as you are a ruler. Things get ugly between them then as Cersei throws her wine in her uncle's face and asks him, By what right do you presume to give me terms? You're no more than one of my father's household knights. Kevin acknowledges that he has no lands or titles, but he flexes his wealth and influence, telling his niece, You would be wise not to take me lightly, your grace, and wiser still not to make of me a foe. Still insisting that he's counselling her, he gives her a final piece of unsolicited advice. If you will not yield the regency to me, name me your castellan for Casterly Rock, and make either Mathis Rowan or Randall Tarley the hand of the king. Mathis Rowan is sensible, prudent, well-liked. Randall Tarley is the finest soldier in the realm, a poor hand for peacetime, but with Tywin dead, there's no better man to finish this war. Lord Tyrell cannot take offence if you choose one of his own bannermen as hand. Both Tarley and Rowan are able men, and loyal. Name either one, and you make him yours. You strengthen yourself, and weaken Highgarden. Yet Mace will likely thank you for it. That is my counsel. Take it or no. You may make Moonboy your hand for all I care. My brother is dead, woman. I am going to take him home. And then, in the face of Cersei's accusation of abandonment, Kevin drops a bombshell. Tommen has his mother, I, he added softly, after a pause. And his father too, I think. So, Cersei goes on to tell Jamie about this exchange, though Jamie doesn't quite believe it at first, until he approaches his uncle as Tywin's funeral cortege prepares to depart the capital for Casterly Rock. They have an exchange about Cersei which doesn't go as well as Jaime had hoped, far from expressing any willingness to make it up with Cersei. When Jaime pleads with him to stay and lend his experience to their efforts, Kevin refuses, leaving Jaime with a similar stab as in his previous confrontation with Cersei. Your sister knows my terms. They have not changed. Tell her that the next time you're in her bedchamber. And next comes a bit of potential foreshadowing for something we'll discuss later in the episode. Jamie is disturbed by his uncle's words and the fact that he knows about the incest, but perhaps more so by the knowledge that Cersei knows he knows. He thinks, 
Sir Kevin was a Lannister of Casterly Rock. He could not believe that she would ever do him harm, but I was wrong about Tyrion. Why not about Cersei? When sons were killing fathers, what was there to stop a niece from ordering an uncle slain? An inconvenient uncle who knows too much. We'll get back to this detail later, but it strikes us as very important that this suspicion should have been introduced in Jamie's mind at a time when he and his sister are already drifting apart. In his next conversation with Cersei, Jamie tries to discuss their uncle, but she's having none of it. In the face of her paranoia about Tyrion and her scorn for both him and Kevin, Jamie tries to reason with his twin. Cersei, listen to yourself. You're seeing dwarfs in every shadow and making foes of friends. Uncle Kevin is not your enemy. I am not your enemy. As we know, however, Cersei wasn't in the mood to take advice from anyone, least of all her brother or uncle. And so, instead of taking any of the fairly good advice she had been offered on who to appoint as Tommen's hand, she chose Kevin's father-in-law, Sir Harris Swift. Swift, she thinks, will be easy for her to control, with the bonus that he was more hostage than hand. It says, So long as she had Sir Harris in hand, Kevin Lannister must needs think twice about opposing her. To be sure, a good father is not the ideal hostage, but better a flimsy shield than none. Not long after, Jamie went into the Riverlands to relieve the siege at Riverrun. It's there that we're introduced to Kevin Lannister's only sister, Jenna Lannister, the wife of Walder Frey's second son, Emmon. She proves to be a shrewd woman who wants to get to the bottom of why Cersei didn't name Kevin as Hand. In fact, she questions Jaime closely on all of Cersei's decision-making. When Jaime simply reminds her that Kevin refused the office, claiming to be tired and full of grief for his dead son and brother, Jenna tells him, I suppose he had a right to be. It has been hard for Kevin living all his life in Tywin's shadow. It was hard for all my brothers. That shadow Tywin cast was long and black, and each of them had to struggle to find a little son. Tiggett tried to be his own man, but he could never match your father, and that just made him angrier as the years went by. Jerrion made japes better to mock the game than play and lose— But Kevin saw how things stood early on, so he made himself a place by your father's side. And so at the end of a feast for crows, the Lannisters are scattered. Kevin has returned to the west, Jaime is in the Riverlands, Cersei is blundering around King's Landing, and is ultimately arrested for her plotting, and Tyrion is on his way to Essos. It's there, travelling with the little band that surrounds the boy known as Young Griff, that Tyrion offers some advice, unknowing of his sister's troubles. If I were you, I would go west instead of east. Land in dawn and raise my banners. The Seven Kingdoms will never be more ripe for conquest than they are right now. A boy king sits the Iron Throne, the North is in chaos, the Riverlands a devastation, a rebel holds Storm's End and Dragonstone. When winter comes, the realm will starve. And who remains to deal with all of this? Who rules the little king who rules the Seven Kingdoms? Why, my own sweet sister, there is no one else. My brother Jamie thirsts for battle, not for power. He's run from every chance he's had to rule. My uncle Kevin would make a passably good regent if someone pressed the duty on him, but he will never reach for it. The gods shaped him to be a follower, not a leader. Well, the gods are my lord father. Mace Tyrell would grasp the scepter gladly, but mine own kin are not like to step aside and give it to him and everyone hates Stannis. Who does that leave? Why, only Cersei. Cersei, in the meantime, is still being held by the faith, and no answer has come from the passionate appeal she had sent to Jaime in the Riverlands. Desperate and suspecting that in her absence the council will have summoned her uncle, she finally requests that he be allowed to visit her. Kevin, now Tommen's regent, arrives the next morning, He's appalled by her affair with Lancel, and he brings other news. 
Jamie is vanished in the Riverlands with the Maid of Tarth, and Marcella has been assaulted and disfigured in Dorne, her sworn shield dead at the hands of the knight called Darkstar. Cersei begs her uncle to get her out of her prison cell, but he has only one solution. Force wouldn't work, he says. Too much of their strength is still in the Riverlands, and furthermore, assaulting the Sept would surely play badly as a political move. There is only one way, he assures her. I have spoken with his High Holiness. He will not release you until you have atoned for your sins. At first, Cersei doesn't understand him and reminds him that she has confessed. No, atoned, says Kevin, and he begins to mention a walk. Then the penny drops and it says, no, she knew what her uncle was about to say and she did not want to hear it. Never tell him that if you speak again. I am a queen, not some dockside whore. Cersei explicitly draws a line of connection, not for the last time, between her grandfather's former mistress and what is being asked of her. Kevin has clearly had a detailed conversation with the High Septon, but Cersei is unwilling to contemplate what he's suggesting. Until her uncle mentions the charges that are being brought against her. His High Holiness is resolved that you be tried for regicide, deicide, incest, and high treason. The High Septon, it seems, wasn't fooled by the denials that were part of her sort of confession. In the face of this, Cersei wonders about her trial, which will be a trial by the faith, her uncle says, unless she insists on a trial by combat. But as the king's mother, for that she must be defended by a knight of the king's guard. Kevin adds, Whatever the outcome, your rule is at an end. I will serve as Tommen's regent until he comes of age. But suddenly the news of Ares Oakheart's death in Dawn becomes very important. Cersei is resolved to demand her trial by combat, but first she must have a champion. With no explanation, she begs her uncle, go to Lord Kyburn on my behalf, bring him a white cloak, and tell him that his time has come. And so, the next time we see Cersei, she is preparing to do as her uncle had urged her in order to get back to Tommen's side. But still, she suffers from doubts. Her uncle said it was the only way to save herself. Was it, though? She could not trust her uncle no more than she trusted this High Septon. However, as powerless as she is at that moment, she sees her options as extremely limited thanks to her uncle's refusal to intervene. If she stayed here, she was doomed, and the only way she would return to the Red Keep was by walking. The High Sparrow had been adamant, and Sir Kevin refused to lift a finger against him. And so Cersei walked, as we covered in our Jamie and Cersei episode, and won't recap fully here, except for the very end, when she arrived at the Red Keep to find her uncle waiting for her at the gate with Sir Boros Blount and Sir Marin Trant. When Cersei cried out for her son, her uncle refused. Not here. No son should have to bear witness to his mother's shame. As someone who witnessed his own father's shame in his youth, we can imagine how these words might have struck home for him. But in spite of her uncle's harsh words, Cersei is also greeted by a new knight of the Kingsguard, introduced to her as Sir Robert Strong. Cersei clearly sees this as salvation, and part of that is thanks to her uncle. Sir Kevin had kept his part of the bargain. Tommen, her precious little boy, had named her champion to the Kingsguard. And that's the last we see from Cersei's point of view. When we next see Kevin, and Cersei for that matter, it will be in the epilogue to A Dance with Dragons, where the Lord Regent is given his own point of view. And so, in our next segment, we'll break down that chapter, a chapter that is both revealing and predictive, the final published chapter of the series to date, and one upon which much of the future of the King's Landing arc hangs.
Radio Westeros is powered by patrons, and thanks to these patrons from the Valyrian Steel level. Sir Tim of House Jib Jab Hot Dog Shop, House Motto, We Forge the Chains We Wear in Life, Erodo, Aileen, Akashika, Akiva of House Hunt, Oxheart, Amber the Adamant, Anna, Hortense of Ashai, Blight Spirit, Cabeth the Unfrozen, Christian, Marja the Mage, David, Dean, Dibbles and Bits, Drew, Sir Sorsadelica, James K, Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Juna of House Aiko, Casey, Lady of the Frostfangs, Lady Silverwing, Infendaris, the Unspeakable Terror, Liam, Boss, the Sothorian, Sally, Tristis Lurian, Wild Child of the Wolfswood, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. Kevin Lannister was beginning to understand why Cersei had grown so resentful of the Tyrells. But this was not the moment to provoke an open quarrel. Randall Tarly and Mace Tyrell had both brought armies to King's Landing, whilst the best part of the strength of House Lannister remained in the Riverlands, fast melting away. In the A Dance with Dragons epilogue, George clearly wanted to provide in-depth exposition about a number of things affecting King's Landing and Westeros in general. By choosing Kevin as the POV, we get to hear the latest gossip in the capital, which is laid out for us in a small council meeting that, in Cersei's absence, we would not be privy to otherwise. Altogether, we counted eight themes or subject matters to which all information in the chapter is related. There's key information on winter, the Tyrells versus the Lannisters and the related upcoming trials, the Westerosi economy, Aegon Targaryen, Daenerys Targaryen, Sir Robert Strong, Dawn, and Randall Tarly. And the real beauty of this epilogue is that all of this exposition is woven together naturally enough to negate any impression that this is an awkward info dump of a chapter. Rather than reading like a series of plot-related bullet points, each theme is threaded through the eye of the narrative to create a series of mini cliffhangers that serve to further ensnare us as readers. Perhaps the broadest overarching theme of the chapter, and one of the first to be explored, is the arrival of winter. In the opening passage, George is keen to inform us that, as Red Ronick Connington speaks... A steady drip, drip, drip punctuated his words as snow melt ran off his cloak to puddle on the floor. The snow had been falling on King's Landing most of the night. Outside, the drifts were ankle deep. Sir Kevin Lannister pulled his cloak about him more closely. There are hints throughout the chapter as to how cold King's Landing has become, and indeed, later on, we get solid confirmation that the season has turned and that winter is finally here. The advent of winter delivers on old promises made early in the books that the long summer would come to an end and that a brutal winter would unfurl before our eyes and inflict itself upon Westeros. The very first line of the first Bran chapter in A Game of Thrones comments on the change in the weather, and with the oft-repeated stark words, winter is coming, drilling home the point, we can conclude that winter, the season where humanity is at its most vulnerable, was always going to be a key element in George's saga, an aspect of his world-building that he's wrapped his story around. From the first scene to the last, this epilogue officially announces the arrival of winter in King's Landing, and then leaves us to contemplate what that's going to mean for the characters inhabiting the story in the aptly named The Winds of Winter. The fact that winter in King's Landing begins with an unexpected pair of murders tells the readers that there is plenty of conflict and surprise to come. And just as Red Ronnet's snow-covered cloak immediately informs us of a change in the weather, his very presence in the Red Keep's throne room highlights another topic which bookends this epilogue. Ronnet is the son of John Connington's cousin Ronald, and as Lord of Griffin's Roost, he's been brought before Kevin and the Small Council to discuss the unexpected invasion of the Stormlands by his cousin John, along with the boy Aegon and the Golden Company. 
In his attempt to protest his own innocence, Ronit says to the council, send me against my uncle and I will bring you back his head and the head of this false dragon too. Ronit had been fighting in the Riverlands with Jamie when Griffin's Roost was taken, and although the reader can be sure of his innocence, the council are understandably concerned that there could be a link between the Connington kinsmen. As Ronit pleads his case, George pans out and shows us around the throne room in order to establish a more detailed sense of setting. Cersei and Marjorie are noted as being absent, with both women soon to face their respective trials for high treason, brought about as much by the emergence of the High Sparrow and his waves of devout followers as by Cersei's own foolhardiness. We see a line of Lannister guardsmen facing Tyrell soldiers on the other side of the room. It's a scene of Lannisters and Tyrells literally standing in opposition. And so, without directly saying it, George shades in the theme of Lannister versus Tyrells by his arrangement of the mise-en-scene. Soon, attention is drawn to the looming presence of the Iron Throne. Coupled with Kevin's thoughts about Tommen being kept away from the meeting in order to keep him with his mother, we are reminded that Kevin, as acting regent, is a very powerful character. As we've said in the episode, he was accustomed to living in his brother's shadow, and now here he is at the head of governance, making key decisions himself. But power is not an easy thing to grasp in Westeros, and as such, Kevin does not have unilateral control. He remains part of a council. With him in the room are fellow councilmen Hand of the King, Mace Tyrell, Master of Laws, Randall Tarley, Master of Coin, Harris Swift, and Grand Maester Pycelle. Harris Swift is Kevin's father-in-law, and Pycelle has proven himself to be an obsequious servant of House Lannister, and so Kevin has a slight edge over the room, three against two. Still, he's rightfully concerned that the balance of power is gradually swinging towards the Tyrells. Kevin's disdain for Mace Tyrell is highlighted almost immediately when Kevin thinks about the, quote, absurd vanity involved in Mace acquiring a ridiculous hand-shaped chair to sit on during these council meetings. The chair might seem like a non-issue, but it symbolises Kevin's fear that the Tyrells are sitting far too comfortably in the capital. George is capitalising on any available opportunity to delineate the increasing tension between the houses. The decision is made to keep Connington under close supervision within the city, and as Ronit leaves the room, Randall and May suggest sending him to the Wall, along with the unscrupulous band of Mountain's men who accompanied him to the city. Kevin is adept at reading between the lines and understands that such a move would be advantageous to the Tyrells, given that there is a need for Westermen in the city watch. Mace has recently added a hundred of his own men to the gold cloaks, creating an imbalance. Kevin thinks, the more I give him, the more he wants. Kevin Lannister was beginning to understand why Cersei had grown so resentful of the Tyrells. And we can't forget that Mace and Randall both brought armies into the capital with them, while the bulk of Lannister forces are still occupied in the Riverlands. The fact that Kevin must make common cause with the Tyrells over the issue of Aegon's invasion and not, quote, provoke an open quarrel with his councilmen highlights the political bind he finds himself in. George likes his politics as multi-layered and complex as it is in the real world, and this mounting tension is surely part of the wider setup for the upcoming novel, when this division will reach its critical mass and perhaps lead to some bloody resolution. At the very heart of the division are, of course, Cersei and Marjorie, who were both due for their respective trials for high treason. Mace would like to cancel his daughter's trial, but it's Kevin who argues that the trial should go ahead, lest the forces of piety ally themselves with the many enemies of the crown. He seems particularly concerned about John Connington and feels that Tyrell and Tarly are underestimating how much the former hand might have matured since his ignominious failures during Robert's rebellion, which led to his exile and ultimately the fall of House Targaryen. 
The discussion slides from Aegon Targaryen to Daenerys Targaryen seamlessly as George continues his exposition of all the threats to Lannister power. Like just about everyone else who hears about Danny, Mace is flippant in his dismissal of her. He states that she's as bad as her father, though the fact that House Tyrell supported King Ares until the bitter end and beyond is not lost on Kevin, although he is too cautious to mention the hypocrisy aloud. But he does insist that Danny and the dragons potentially joining Aegon's invasion would represent a significant threat, which adds urgency to the notion of destroying John Connington. Mace, of course, refuses to march on Aegon's forces until the matter of his daughter's trial is resolved. At this point, Pacelle butts in, suggesting that the Crown could buy off the Golden Company, given that they are sellswords. Readers have long speculated that there is a secret contract written in blood, a Blackfire angle to the Golden Company's support of Aegon, yet Pacelle has not considered this possibility. Instead, the Grand Maester's suggestion leads into a conversation about Westerosi economics, and soon Harris Swift reminds us that the Crown's coffers are, more or less, empty. Alas, my lords, our vaults contain only rats and roaches. I have written again to the Mirish bankers. If they will agree to make good the crown's debt to the Bravosi and extend us a new loan, mayhaps we will not have to raise the taxes. Kevin is afraid to raise taxes with so much dissatisfaction and rebellion in the air. And so, as master of coin, Harris Swift is ordered to Bravos to deal with the Iron Bank. May seem supportive of this move, which is no surprise given that it would take yet another Lannister man off the small council, remembering that Lord Commander Jamie Lannister remains stuck in the Riverlands. The tension in the room manifests in Sir Harris implying that Mace secretly pillaged Dragonstone for his own gain, an accusation which is hotly denied and Kevin swiftly changes the course of the conversation to avoid further conflict, bringing up the subject of Sir Robert Strong. Cersei has chosen the silent giant to defend her in her upcoming trial, and it's interesting to be privy to Kevin's opinion of Strong. The audience by now is fully aware that Strong is Gregor Clegane come again, reanimated by Kyburn's dark Frankenstein-esque magic. Kevin's internal monologue confirms that he too has the same suspicions. It says, Marin Trant claimed that Strong took neither food nor drink, and Boris Blount went so far as to say he had never seen the man use the privy. Why should he? Dead men do not shit. Kevin Lannister had a strong suspicion of just who this Sir Robert really was beneath that gleaming white armor, a suspicion that Mace Tyrell and Randall Tarley no doubt shared. Whatever the face hidden behind Strong's helm, it must remain hidden for now. The silent giant was his niece's only hope. In spite of the obvious concern from all parties, Kevin reminds the room that Strong is not just Cersei's only hope, but Marjorie's too. If Cersei loses her trial, Tommen will be deemed illegitimate, and so Marjorie, and thus the Tyrells, would be completely disempowered. This is the bind that holds Lannister and Tyrell together. Although they are in a political battle with each other, at the heart of it, the two great houses do have common cause. If Tommen ceases to be a king, Marjorie will cease to be a queen. Kevin let Tyrell chew on that a moment. Kevin goes on to assure the room that henceforth, Cersei will be excluded from political decision-making and eventually sent back to Casterly Rock if and when she wins her trial. It's clear Kevin deems her to be a liability and believes he's acted appropriately in agreeing to the Walk of Shame and her trial with the High Sparrow. However, he's fully aware that her ignominious fall from grace has ruined her public perception forever And so there are more than a few hints that Kevin is carrying a sense of guilt for going against his own blood in such a dramatic fashion. Let's look at this passage in Kevin's thoughts. Cersei was soiled goods now, her power at an end. Every baker's boy and beggar in the city had seen her in her shame, and every tart and tanner from Flea Bottom to Pisswater Bend had gazed upon her nakedness, their eager eyes crawling over her breasts and belly and woman's parts. 
No queen could expect to rule again after that. In gold and silk and emeralds, Circe had been a queen, the next thing to a goddess. Naked, she was only human, an aging woman with stretch marks on her belly and teats that had begun to sag, as the shrews in the crowd had been glad to point out to their husbands and lovers. Better to live shamed than die proud, Sir Kevin told himself. The fact that Kevin is telling himself that this situation was justified sounds very much as if he's trying to convince himself that he's done the right thing. But what would Tywin think if he were watching on? It's true that Tywin presided over a similar walk of shame when his father's mistress was adjudged to be overstepping her mark. Yet, inflicting this level of public humiliation on Cersei herself is another matter entirely. Although Kevin believes he's acting in the interests of House Lannister by disempowering his niece, there is certainly evidence of cognitive dissonance in his thoughts, and more on that shortly. Kevin continues to bite his tongue when Mace protests Marjorie's innocence, as he wonders why, in that case, Mace would need an army in the capital. The chapter is punctuated by such moments of diplomacy from Kevin, who's smart enough to conceal his true thoughts. Clearly, he believes the escalating situation with the Tyrells would be best resolved via subtlety rather than confrontation. When the subject of Marcella and Dorne arises and Mace bluntly expresses his belief that the princess could find a better match, Kevin again thinks one thing and says another. He immediately guesses that Mace wants Marcella paired with his son Willis, while explaining aloud that the crown cannot afford to insult Dorne. Dawn is obviously a sour subject for Mace, with his son Willis having been crippled by Oberyn Martell and a long history of conflict between the two houses, yet Kevin's point is a good one. He says, if Doran Martell were to join his strength to Connington's in support of this Thane dragon, things could go very ill for all of us. With the dramatic irony of the audience being fully aware that Doran Martell is gearing up to inflict revenge on the Lannisters at some point, via fire and blood, we can see that Kevin is a decent reader of the Game of Thrones, certainly a few steps ahead of Mace. Arianne Martell seems likely to join her house to Aegon's cause in the Winds of Winter, and so this conversation in the small council serves as prefiguring and groundwork for that eventuality. The meeting comes to an end when Kevin asks the council to reconvene in five days after Cersei's trial. The reader now realises that the trial is imminent as it stands and will likely be covered early in the winds of winter, encouraging us to speculate just who will be chosen to oppose Sir Robert Strong in the trial by combat and what will happen during the course of proceedings. May the warrior lend strength to Sir Robert's arms, says Mace before giving the most cursory of bows, but Kevin is still grateful for even that. The dynamics of the meeting were fascinating, two houses in a silent war with each other, yet utterly dependent on one another. The unspoken conflict between them really drove the council meeting as a piece of writing and created the sense of drama necessary to negate the danger of the chapter feeling like too much of an info dump. But as the meeting comes to an end, the exposition continues. Mace removes himself from the scene, allowing Kevin to refocus on Randall Tarley. As the Reachman leaves the meeting, Kevin thinks, Tarley is the real danger. A narrow man, but iron-willed and shrewd, and as good a soldier as the Reach could boast. But how do I win him to our side? The fact that Kevin judges Tali to be a linchpin in the Tyrell setup, and one who could possibly be persuaded to switch allegiances, should not be overlooked. Of course we know Kevin will take his ambition of tempting Tarly away from the Tyrells to his grave, but there remains fan speculation that Tarly might be dissatisfied with his liege and will soon defect to Aegon's cause, if he hasn't already. Whatever the case, it was interesting to witness Kevin evaluating the man, although it's plain to see that Kevin is far softer than Tywin in his general manner, the notion of recruiting an enemy is surely Tywin-esque, given what we know about his involvement in setting Walder Frey against Robb Stark 
culminating in the demise of the latter at the brutal Red Wedding. And while Kevin is silently evaluating Tarly, Pacell is more concerned with his own safety. The Grand Maester feels vulnerable as a Lannister toady who confessed the details of Marjorie's request for moon tea, which are now a key part of the fornication accusations being made against her. Pacell says that House Tyrell has no love for him and requests extra protection. If it pleased the Lord Regent, I would sleep more soundly if you could lend me some of your guards. However, Kevin questions the need for extra guards for three reasons. First of all, Kevin does not believe the Tyrells would be so bold as to assassinate the Grand Maester so openly, even though he suspects Mace would like to replace Pycelle with Garth the Gross. Second, he thinks that suddenly giving Pycelle extra protection could cause offence, given it might imply that Kevin doesn't trust Mace. And finally, in between worrying about everything from John Conning to Randall Tarly, Kevin does seem overloaded with pressing concerns and perhaps does not give Pycelle's request adequate contemplation. Indeed, Kevin's attention is focused on the small council and he's soon reflecting on the fact that if and when Master of Ships Paxter Redwine returns to the city, the council will stand at three for Lannister, three for Tyrell. The seventh voice would be that of Nymeria Sand, a Dornish voice, which will no doubt offend Mace Tyrell and perhaps cause problems for the council as a whole. Kevin wishes Littlefinger were still on the council instead, a man who could aid their search for gold dragons. With his thoughts being so scattered, Kevin concludes that he will not give up any of his official guardsmen for Pycelle and instead encourages the Grand Maester to employ the Mountain's men recently arrived in the city with Red Ronick Connington. Of course, Kevin has no way of knowing that Varys is an imminent threat, but his decision to refuse Pycelle Lannister guardsmen will later haunt him, however briefly. Kevin leaves the throne room with Pycelle and Harris Swift and orders the latter to prepare to sail to Bravos to treat with the Iron Bank, which provides the direct setup for Arya's first Winds of Winter chapter. The Mercy chapter was released as a sample on George's official website on March 26th of 2014, but according to George, had been written years before, so the setup here was intentional. It's probably worth mentioning that up in the frozen north, Stannis has already struck a deal of his own with the Iron Bank and has gained their support. Harris Swift's chances of success are slight though none of the councillors know it. Outside the throne room, we see firsthand how cold King's Landing has become, with the icy wind snapping at Kevin's cloak as he observes the three feet of snow filling the dry moat around Magor's holdfast. Merrin Trant is guarding the frozen drawbridge, and Kevin considers the fact that the King's Guard is currently depleted with only Trant, Boris Blount, and Robert Strong to protect the royal family. George is reminding the reader that there is a definite vulnerability within the Red Keep, a fact which will soon become highly pertinent to the direction of the chapter. Kevin thinks about giving his son Lancel Lannister a white cloak, which he deems more honourable than Lancel's current position within the Warrior's Sons. And coming in from the cold, Kevin drinks mulled wine and sits by the fire to warm himself. However, his duties are far from over, given he plans to have supper with Cersei. As Kevin prepares himself for the occasion, he once again reflects on his niece. Not for the first time in the chapter, he attempts to justify his actions in his own mind. He thinks, I have no reason to feel guilty. Tywin would understand that, surely. It was his daughter who brought shame down on our name, not I. What I did, I did for the good of House Lannister. Earlier we mentioned that Kevin seems assailed by guilt over Cersei's walk of shame, and it's clear that whatever decisions he's responsible for regarding Cersei's downfall are gnawing away at his conscience. But that one phrase, what I did, I did for the good of House Lannister, gives us pause. That phrase, more than anything else that he or Cersei thinks or does, suggests that the plan for the Walk of Shame may have come directly from Kevin himself. 
We've discussed how Kevin was the first one to raise the subject of a walk of atonement to Cersei, and how she knew before he finished saying the words what was being suggested. Cersei seemed to think the punishment had been demanded by the High Septon, and merely assumes that her uncle agreed to it because he dared not oppose the faith with no army to back him up. It can be said without a doubt that the family history regarding Tywin's treatment of Lord Titus's mistress looms large in both Cersei's and Kevin's minds, but of the two of them only Kevin was actually present to witness that event. And Kevin spends a deal of time thinking about the fate of his father's mistress. It's clear that in that case it was Tywin's decision to punish the woman in such a way and as part of the feelings of guilt he's experiencing over what Cersei has just gone through, Kevin thinks, surely Tywin would never have dreamed that same fate awaited his own golden daughter. As if to convince himself, Kevin says aloud, it had to be. To appease the faith and save Tommen, Cersei had to be removed. Kevin recognises her as a, quote, vain, foolish, greedy woman, and moreover, he questions her motherhood. Surely in the face of all the shame she was bringing up on House Lannister, Tywin would have approved of his decision. What we think is worrying Kevin is that he's probably very well aware that Tywin never once tried to punish their father publicly for being weak and foolish. Tywin took out his anger on the people who took advantage of Tytos, a very different situation from actually humiliating and degrading a member of the family in public. And so Kevin continues to try to convince himself that he acted appropriately, probably suspecting that Tywin, as fond as he was of sharp lessons, would never have allowed Cersei's very public humiliation to happen. In order to preserve the Lannister name and image, it's much more likely that Tywin would have used a more subtle or private method of delivering his lesson, and none would know this more than Kevin. When it's finally time to face the lioness in her den, as he puts it, and Kevin begins his meal with Cersei, he notices the changes in her since her walk of atonement. The queen was dressed as modestly as any matron in a dark brown gown that buttoned up to her throat and a hooded green mantle that covered her shaved head. Before her walk, she would have flaunted her baldness beneath a golden crown. Throughout the meal, Kevin is clearly relieved that the lioness's claws have been clipped, while still being regretful that controlling Cersei has come at such a great personal cost to her. It says, Sir Kevin could not remember ever seeing his niece so quiet, so subdued, so demure. All for the good, he supposed, but it made him sad as well. Her fire is quenched, she who used to burn so bright. Kevin is clearly struggling with the dilemmas involved in acting for the good of the family. The concept of hurting a family member in order to protect the family name seems almost contradictory and puts us in mind of classic gangster stories such as The Godfather where similar themes are explored. We've continually framed Kevin in the role of enforcer for his elder brother and as that's a role that's commonly seen in organised crime groups, carrying that analogy forward works very well here. And it's within Kevin's internal conflict here that George's classic human heart in conflict with itself motif manifests. Kevin begins a discussion of the upcoming trial with his niece, but after just a few moments, a boy arrives with a note requesting that he visit Pycelle immediately. Grandmaster Pycelle begs the favour of the Lord Regent's presence at once. Given that the Grand Maester could have received news from Storm's End, the North, or even Jamie, Kevin does not hesitate. He kisses Cersei on her hand before he goes, and we're reminded that should Sir Robert Strong fail her, that could be the last kiss his niece would ever know. Cersei's trial is now perfectly poised to ensure that the Winds of Winter is hotly anticipated. And attention is drawn to the fact Pycelle's messenger is a small, silent boy, who Kevin pays very little mind to. He even gives the lad a penny in thanks, before setting off for the rookery. 
When Kevin arrives, he encounters another youngster, a girl, who opens the door for him. The girl also remains perfectly silent throughout the interaction, and Kevin enters Pycelle's cold and shadowy chambers. Then Kevin observes this. On the window seat, a raven loitered, pale, huge, its feathers ruffled. It was the largest raven that Kevin Lannister had ever seen. Larger than any hunting hawk at Casterly Rock, larger than the largest owl. Blowing snow danced around it, and the moon painted it silver. Not silver. White. The bird is white. The white ravens of the citadel did not carry messages as their dark cousins did. When they went forth from Old Town, it was for one purpose only, to herald a change of seasons. Winter, said Sir Kevin. So finally, we have that confirmation of winter arriving in the capital. As we said, it's a hugely important aspect of the story, and witnessing the White Raven at the very tail end of A Dance with Dragons sets up the next novel perfectly. But before Kevin can contemplate what the advent of winter is going to mean for him, House Lannister, and the Seven Kingdoms, he feels something slam into his chest between the ribs. It drove the breath from him and sent him lurching backwards. The white raven took to the air, its pale wings slapping him about the head. Sir Kevin half sat and half fell onto the window seat. What? Who? A quarrel was sunk almost to the fletching in his chest. No. No, that was how my brother died. Blood was seeping out around the shaft. Pycelle, he muttered, confused. Help me. I... Then he saw. Grand Maester Pycelle was seated at his table, his head pillowed on the great leather-bound tome before him. Sleeping, Kevin thought, until he blinked and saw the deep red gash in the old man's spotted skull and the blood pooled beneath his head, staining the pages of his book. All around his candle were bits of bone and brain, islands in a lake of melted wax. Kevin's next thought is regret for not agreeing to the Grand Maester's request for personal guards. He then assumes the culprit is his nephew Tyrion, before Varys emerges. Varys had been missing since aiding Tyrion's escape from the Red Keep, and as such, first-time readers can be forgiven for forgetting about the former Master of Whisperers. But in hindsight, there were a few clues that the eunuch was about to return. There was the silent boy ostensibly sent by Pycelle to Kevin, and the little girl who opened the rookery doors without saying a word. Varys is known to employ children as spies, and many of them have their tongues removed in order to keep secrets. After condemning Kevin to his doom, Varys apologises. Forgive me if you can. I bear you no ill will. This was not done from malice. It was for the realm... For the children. The irony of Varys claiming the high ground of acting for the children while employing mutilated little birds should not be lost on the reader, and it works in parallel with the theme of Kevin acting for the family by presiding over Cersei's downfall. And the talk of children reminds the dying Kevin of his own children and immediate family. He thinks of his wife Dorna as pain washes over him. Kevin is understandably shocked and bemused by proceedings, pointing out that, quote, There are hundreds of Lannister guardsmen in this castle. But the reader understands that Varys is the one person who knows the Red Keep inside and out, with its labyrinthine tunnels and subterranean secrets. Varys watches on calmly and explains that Kevin was doing too good of a job in resolving the problems within King's Landing and stabilizing the realm. You were threatening to undo all the Queen's good work, to reconcile Highgarden and Casterly Rock, bind the faith to your little king, unite the seven kingdoms under Tommen's rule. Stability is evidently not what Varys wants, and the eunuch's continuing apologies whilst murdering Kevin frame him as a man with both a cold heart and a complex sense of honor. This is another instance of a man with political ambitions attempting to act for the greater good as he sees it, 
a theme we see employed in Stannis' story, among others. And Varys goes on to describe Kevin as a good man in service to a bad cause, before offering further explanation of his murderous plot. Your niece will think the Tyrells had you murdered, mayhaps with the connivance of the imp. The Tyrells will suspect her. Someone somewhere will find a way to blame the Dornish men. Doubt, division, and mistrust will eat the very ground beneath your boy king, whilst Aegon raises his banner above Storm's End, and the lords of the realm gather round him. When Kevin hears Varys mention Aegon, he reacts with disbelief, recalling the day he saw the royal baby swaddled in the crimson cloak of House Lannister, stained with blood and brains. Varys responds with a monologue which reminds us of the long game he's been playing with his political partner, Illyrio Mopatis. He is here. Aegon has been shaped for rule since before he could walk. He has been trained in arms as befits a knight to be, but that was not the end of his education. He reads and writes. He speaks several tongues. He has studied history and law and poetry. A septa has instructed him in the mysteries of the faith since he was old enough to understand them. He has lived with fisherfolk, worked with his hands, swum in rivers and mended nets, and learned to wash his own clothes at need. He can fish and cook and bind up a wound. He knows what it is like to be hungry, to be hunted, to be afraid. Tommen has been taught that kingship is his right. Aegon knows that kingship is his duty, that a king must put his people first and live and rule for them. It seems that Varys genuinely believes that Aegon is some sort of perfect prince. Given the audience has seen Aegon up close and borne witness to his imperfections, such as his temper tantrum while playing Sivas, this sentiment seems wholly naive. In fact, the whole concept of manufacturing a perfect prince seems flawed, and on further inspection, Varys could actually be describing Daenerys Targaryen, who has faced greater and more authentic privation and danger than Aegon ever did. That passage has been poured over many times by readers researching the Blackfire conspiracy theory, which purports that Varys, Illyrio, and Aegon are linked to House Blackfire. If Aegon really is a secret Blackfyre descendant, why would Varys lie to a dying man about Aegon's authenticity? The short answer is that Varys has been in character for decades, and he knows more than anyone else that if a secret is not kept closely, someone always tells. He knows the little birds are listening and therefore would not risk his long game by divulging the truth. And we recommend catching our 25th episode on the Blackfyre conspiracy for an in-depth look at the Blackfire Theory and Varys' long game. By now, Kevin is struggling to speak, and Varys acknowledges he's been going on like some silly old woman. The eunuch has, of course, been providing invaluable exposition of his own motives for the reader, but he finally decides that Kevin has suffered enough. With one last apology, Kevin whistles to a hidden group of little birds who emerge with daggers in their hands. It's a grim and shocking end to the chapter, and indeed to a dance with dragons, but one that has massive implications for the Winds of Winter, which we'll discuss in the next segment. Varys has utterly destabilised King's Landing and marked himself as a key political player going forward, and the chapter ultimately generates enough Aegon-related intrigue to leave us hungry for more. And aside from the final burst of excitement to keep us all hooked, overall this epilogue does a fine job in reminding the reader of the various plot threads. Many of the important settings are mentioned, from the Wall to Dorne to Marine, and it was interesting to get the perspective from the capital before Kevin's final departure from the story. George had to touch so many bases within this chapter, and he did so with great balance. However, the threads of exposition woven into this chapter did come at a cost. As an epilogue, the chapter is ultimately more plot than character driven, and in this sense, Kevin remains somewhat of an enigma to readers. 
there's mention of his visit to Dragonstone earlier in his life, and although we can hazard a guess that this relates to the War of the Ninepenny Kings, we cannot be certain or know what happened there. Similarly, Kevin mentions his wife Dorna briefly, yet we learn next to nothing about her. It would have been fantastic to learn more of Kevin's backstory and character, but there simply wasn't room for too much development, with the focus kept on recapping, exposition of the wider story, and the final murderous drama. And that drama ultimately denoted Kevin as one of the many pawns in the story who had begun to see himself as a player. His demise provokes the question, will Lannister diplomacy die with him? Now Cersei has to lift herself up after her public shaming and face her judgment. With Sir Robert Strong as her champion, her trial by combat is surely a formality, and with Kevin gone, the onus is on her to overcome her obstacles and enemies and empower House Lannister once more. And the situation with Cersei is just one of the plot lines which will be greatly impacted by Kevin's death. Stay tuned to hear what we have to say about the aftermath of this epilogue. I thought the crossbow fitting. You shared so much with Lord Tywin, why not that? Your niece will think the Tyrells had you murdered, mayhaps with the connivance of the inn. The Tyrells will suspect her. Someone somewhere will find a way to blame the Dornishmen. Doubt, division and mistrust will eat at the very ground beneath your boy king, whilst Aegon raises his banner above Storm's End, and the lords of the realm gather round him. As Kevin Lannister sits before him, dying, Varys lays out for him exactly what he thinks will happen next. Complete destabilization of the Lannister-Tyrell alliance that is all that's holding the realm together. In A Feast for Crows, when Cersei first asked him to serve as Tommen's hand, Kevin told her, Open your eyes and look about you, Cersei. The kingdom is in ruins. He was making the point that, in his opinion, only Tywin could have set things to rights. But Cersei thought she was more than up to the challenge herself. Fast forward half a year, and the ruin has accelerated, mostly due to Cersei's efforts, her good work, as Varys puts it. And because of the fragile nature of the alliance that occupies the capital, Varys is most likely going to be rewarded with exactly what he predicted in terms of chaos and dissension. Cersei is already deeply paranoid and suspicious of Mace Tyrell, Cersei will no doubt initially suspect Tyrion, even as her uncle did, but once Harris Swift informs her of Pycelle's request for guards to protect him against possible retribution by the Tyrells for his testimony against Marjorie, she'll see the Tyrells' hands in this, as she did in the matter of Tyrion's escape, when she was led to believe that a gold coin found in the under-jailer Rugen's cell had been given to him by Elena Tyrell. And so, while Cersei blames Mace and begins to plot her revenge, which in this case must be something that will rid her of the Tyrells once and for all, Mace will suspect Cersei. It seems more than possible, given the timeline in the recent discussion in Council of Myrcella and Nymeria Sands' imminent arrival, that the Dornish contingent will arrive in the city on the heels of the double murder, leading to someone, as Varys suggested, laying blame at their door. Though Kevin was regent, Mace was and will continue to be Hand of the King, and he will likely make a few power moves of his own in the wake of these deaths. Most of these will probably involve placing Tyrells or Tyrell Bannerman in important positions. Kevin was concerned about Tyrells in the gold cloaks and the balance of power on the small council. Look for more Tyrells to join the council, which will be made fairly uncomfortable by the presence of Nymeria Sand. Men like Maester Gorman, previously a finalist for the position of Grand Maester, and Garth Tyrell could well be waiting in the wings for this opportunity. And then there's the Kingsguard. 
Kevin contemplates the weakness of the guard on the night of his death, with Boros Blount seeming unhealthy, perhaps to the point of being unfit, Jamie absent without leave in the Riverlands, Loris Tyrell still recovering from his wounds taken at Dragonstone. Oswald Kettleblack has been arrested for fornication with the Queen, and Balon Swan is in Dorne chasing Darkstar. Kevin thought he had a precedent he could use to shore up the guard with more adequate members. It says... In the past, the King's Guard had served for life, but that had not stopped Joffrey from dismissing Sir Barristan Selmy to make a place for his dog, Sander Clegane. And so we wonder if this is more prefiguring of steps Mace will take. Look for more roses in the King's Guard as well, and with Jamie in communicado for weeks, perhaps he will even be dismissed in absentia, with Loris named as his replacement. Remember that, at least until her trial is over, Cersei will be powerless to do anything but fume, and there's a real possibility Mace might contrive to have her trial postponed while he strengthens his position. Then, too, we have to remember Kevin's extremely blunt words about the outcome of Cersei's trial to Marjorie's father. If Cersei is found guilty of fornication and incest with her brother and Tommen's legitimacy is called into question he will, by law, cease to be king, and, quote, if Tommen ceases to be a king, Marjorie ceases to be a queen. So Mace will have to at least publicly support Cersei until after her trial. And speaking of trials, we know that Mace has refused to leave the city to deal with John Connington until after Marjorie's trial. Because the Winds of Winter spoiler chapters, and spoiler alert here, tell us that Mace is marching on Storm's End, we can assume that Marjorie will either be found innocent or Mace will delay his daughter's trial as well. We must assume that Cersei will prevail. How could she not with Sir Robert Strong as her champion? Mace dislikes Cersei and will probably suspect her of the murders, but he also thinks she's been neutralised by her walk of shame. Once her innocence is established at trial and his own position as father-in-law to the king is safe and he's taken steps to strengthen his control of the capital, he's unlikely to do anything directly to Cersei that could seriously check her. Perhaps she'll even agree to retire to Casterly Rock upon his return. In any case, we can be pretty sure that she'll wait until he's left the capital with his army in order to make her move against House Tyrell. And speaking of Robert Strong, and of the Dornish about to arrive in the city, let's recall something Nymeria Sand said at Sunspear in A Dance with Dragons, as the Martell family viewed the skull purported to be that of Gregor Clegane. If Gregor Clegane is alive, soon or late the truth will out. The man was eight feet tall. There's not another like him in all of Westeros. If any such appears again, Cersei Lannister will be exposed as a liar before all the Seven Kingdoms. Now, Nymeria is about to arrive in the capital, only to find Cersei being guarded by an eight-foot-tall guardsman of no particular history. Without Kevin there to manage that situation... Expect that to become ugly fairly quickly. In fact, there are a couple of other ways in which the Dornish situation could become extremely ugly that are prefigured in Kevin's chapter. First, Kevin worries about the possibility of Doran joining his strength with Aegon, and of course from spoiler chapters we can say that is very likely to happen. Second, Kevin thinks that Randall Tarly is, quote, the real danger, and if fans speculation that Tarly might also join with Aegon and by extension Dawn comes to pass, that would become a major issue for Tyrells and Lannisters alike in the Winds of Winter, since with Jaime off in the Riverlands and potentially even dismissed by the Hand as we suggested, the Crown would have virtually no competent military commanders at that point. All in all, just about everything that Kevin worried about in his single point of view chapter could function as setup or prefiguring for the Winds of Winter, as we said in the last segment, not the least of which are the two major themes that bookend the chapter, Winter and Aegon's Invasion. 
Those two themes, more than anything else, should drive the action in King's Landing when the story continues. But the biggest character affecting the plot in King's Landing will of course be Cersei Lannister. With Kevin dead and Jamie missing, there isn't a single person who can rein her in once her trial is over. In The Winds of Winter, Cersei will be unmoored from whatever foundation her family has provided her in the past. Whilst Kevin may have disapproved of her, and even had a hand in her humiliation, alive he would have had the potential to protect her from her worst impulses. Even Jamie had come to see her for what she was, and during his travels in the Riverlands, wondered how he could bring about a number of things that actually came to pass. He would need to find some way to winkle Tommen from her clutches before the boy became another Joffrey, and whilst at that, he should find the lad a new small council too. If Cersei can be put aside, Sir Kevin may agree to serve as Tommen's hand. So, Kevin's death will be the single immediate factor in Cersei reasserting herself, and Jaime is unlikely to be close at hand because when he hears the news, he will almost certainly suspect her. In A Feast for Crows, he had a conversation with his uncle in which it became obvious that Kevin believed the stories about Jaime's and Cersei's incestuous relationship. We mentioned earlier how important it was that this suspicion was introduced into Jamie's mind. In light of Kevin's murder, we have to assume that these thoughts will surface in Jamie's mind, and he'll wonder again, with more cause this time, if his twin is capable of murdering a family member in cold blood. All in all, it seems likely that, in death, Kevin's influence on events is going to be magnified beyond what it was in life. As Tywin's chief advisor, he was present for many of the key events in the Seven Kingdoms and the Westerlands for the past 40 years. As we've said though, he may not have been doing a lot of actual advising, his role seems to have been more enforcer or expediter. And so... Having summed up the potential impacts of Kevin Lannister's death, we arrive at our final word on Kevin Lannister's life. Vera states that Kevin is a good man in service to a bad cause and expresses sorrow at the necessity of his death. While this might have proved true when Kevin was briefly in control as Tommen's regent, we wonder if that was enough to neutralize the years of being Tywin's right-hand man of participating in events like the extermination of the Rains and Tarbex and the sack of King's Landing? What about his role in Cersei's walk of shame? There's a strong case to be made that, to use Tywin's turn of phrase regarding Walder Frey's planning of the Red Wedding, Kevin hatched that ugly chicken all by himself. However much we might loathe Cersei and agree that she deserved some punishment, can we justify the walk of shame as being an appropriate punishment for her crimes? Can we in any way excuse Kevin for his part in her humiliation? Ultimately, we must place Kevin Lannister somewhere along the darker side of the spectrum of grey that George tends to paint most of his characters in. None are wholly good, and few are wholly evil. Gaining his POV did help to shade some nuance into the character, showing us how much he cared about his wife and children, about the realm and about his family's legacy. His sister Jenna referred to Kevin's honour when talking about her brothers with Jamie and of his devotion to Tywin, something Tyrion also witnessed. Perhaps Varys was correct in the essence of what he said, but at the end of the day, Kevin Lannister chose to support his elder brother in everything he did, and so no matter how good or honourable he was at his core, we think that he must be judged on his actions. Kevin Lannister was a company man to the bone, a man who would do anything for his family. In the end, that devotion led directly to his death. Sir Kevin was cold as ice, and every laboured breath sent a fresh stab of pain through him. He glimpsed movement, heard the soft scuffling sound of slippered feet on stone. A child emerged from a pool of darkness, a pale boy in a ragged robe no more than nine or ten, 
Another rose up behind the Grand Maester's chair. The girl who had opened the door for him was there as well. They were all around him, half a dozen of them, white-faced children with dark eyes, boys and girls together. And in their hands, the daggers. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode all about Kevin Lannister and the A Dance with Dragons epilogue. We'll be back soon with a new regular episode as well as a companion live stream to this episode. And now, as always, it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to George R.R. R. Martin for the depth of his characters, and thanks to Kevin McLeod and Kai Engel for allowing us to use their music in our production. And as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Sincere thanks to AJ, Egg on the Sixth, Alex, Ali B, Ali C, Amber, Oakenfist, Brian, Camille, Casey, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Christian, Christine, Maddie and Jessica, Clay, Sir Duncan Cole, Convenience or Death, Sir Archibald Cadogan, Dag Blah Blah, Dan S, Dan the Good, Dimitri B, Dennis, Direwolf, Eric, Esme, Emily of the Eerie, Ezra, Felix, Greg, History of Westeros, Ingveld, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Brendan B. Fish, Goldie Juke, Jim McGeehan, Winter's King, John Aris, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Sonarion the White Storm, Julie Beth of Tarth, Judson, Catherine, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Brash Candy, Tree Girl, Sir Galahu of What, Knight of the Laughing Tree, Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, Lemmy B, Lord Young of the Ghost Woods, Maria, Margareta, Matt A, Matt C, Matt K, Matt L, Lady Beatrix of House Grey, Melinda, Maester Mary, Michael M, Mitchell, Anime Lover Nicole, Patrick, Peter Pebble, PJ, Philip, Paul B, Paul H, Richard, Sam, Sarah, Scott Greenseer, Sir Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Sir Swift, Sherry, Sheila, Sern, Terry, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, The Tattered Princess, Theo, The Cannibal of Casterly Rock, Hema Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel, Virginie, Corrin Halfhand, and Yvonne. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal or Coffee, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or email. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with a new episode. Bye for now.